Um, hi, my name's uh, David Finkel. I'm with uh, Jewish Voice for Peace Detroit. Um, we're, uh, JVP is very grateful to the um, Middle East Working Group of the Presbyterians for organizing this weekend. Um, I wanted to say just briefly that the Jewish community is not a walled off entity. Um, it's not immune from all of the other, uh, you know, from the same issues that, uh, that affect everyone else. One of the things that's been widely remarked is the declining participation, particularly of young Jews in organized Jewish life, particularly uh, young Jews in America who were social justice oriented um, are increasingly just walking away at this point from organized Jewish life because if it's going to be border guards for the Israeli state, um, it doesn't have anything really to offer them. Um, so I think that um, a lot of what Mark has to say is very relevant in, in that respect. I think that at the political and diplomatic level, things will change only when Israel is seen to be more of, an, more of a liability than an asset for America's global management uh, and attempts to control the Middle East. That's why there was a big crisis when, uh, over the attack on the flotilla. Uh, so that's where the real change will come. But all, uh, the, the question, uh, the question um, that I would ask is um, basically for the, for the three panelists, um, to what extent do you think that um, churches in America, the various denominations, are applying consistently to this issue, the Middle East issue, um, their social justice principles that they apply to other issues, whatever those may be? Well, I, I know the Presbyterian Church has been very active in trying to identify the issues and then to work on the issues. Just look at all the reports that we've written in our general assemblies and the reactions that have come out of that. And I, uh, Carol Hilkemer, who's been speaking here, is chair of the Israeli, Israeli Palestine Network Organization of our denomination. And she could probably tell you many things about the hopes that that will ever happen, to what extent. And I think. Again, we have to be forthright and honest. And I don't think we're ever going to get 100% support for these particular social issues that are politically uh, fraught with all kinds of shows and rocks and, and that sort of thing. I, I keep hoping that the Presbyterian Church will be recognized as one who can change and that things will become different in the future. I don't see a lot of that right now from what I read and people with whom I speak. But I think, as I said before in my initial remarks, we are a reformed community. And to be a reformed community means you change. You don't do the same thing decade after decade after century after century because times change and you're in a different context. And I think that there are people in the Presbyterian community who really believe that. And they're willing to give up the old tried and true ways of doing things in order to move forward. So I have hope. I'm pessimistic. I'm probably the most cynical of the cynics. But I still have hope. And I think that's what the Christian community and the church community is supposed to be doing, continue to give people hope. But uh, Mark has said he's not completely convinced that much can be done. And I look at all the presidents before that started the peace process, and where did it go? In the ELCA, um, our bishops are very active. Our most active advocacy ready bench for the presiding bishop is 
is on the Israeli-Palestinian situation, um, that the bishops went there, this is on their hearts. The difficulty for us, the challenge and the opportunity, if we can get this in the heart of the whole church, where people are saying there can be a resolution or something that is far more just than in what is happening now, if that happened in the pews, just to 10% of the way that we have that in the bishops, it would be transformative. Uh, when people go into and speak to somebody from Congress and say this is important, do this now, um, that will be heard. But people can, they can actually dismiss a bishop and say, well, that was approved in some kind of an assembly, but um, those aren't my constituents. So th I think that's the real challenge. How do we get this in the grassroots so that people are actually talking to their representatives saying, make this a priority now? because we can't afford to wait. Methodism was originally a movement uh, within the Anglican uh, church in, in England. And it was a movement for, um, uh, within the cities in particular, and a, a movement for justice. Ab uh, the abolition of slavery was built into the lifestyle covenant that uh, the early Methodists uh, shared and, and committed to in the, uh, in the movement built around uh, small groups. When it became a church in the States, uh, those, that discipline uh, became a pretty, pretty well-defined uh, uh, structure of uh, social principles, uh, which uh, is in our hymnal and uh, proclaimed, not exactly as a confession of faith, but there are ways to formulate it uh, that way. And I think that the best of the responses from the conferences um, in particular, and, and the general conference, in response to Al Israel and Palestine, is, is working from, really directly from those uh, social principles. Uh, I think your question, uh, David, raises the same thing that, uh, that Mark is raising, the way in which that's been uh, mitigated and hampered uh, by guilt uh, related to the, to the Holocaust. And uh, so I, I think we're, the question that's being raised here and in uh, uh, Mark Braverman's book uh, is right on time for the for the Methodists, it, it ought to push us to be more fully who we are. <laughs>